and welcome back to Watches Tonight. Welcome back, guys, the trading desk. Hi, and welcome to a quick spin with the watch box. Joe V asks, right here, Tim, what is up with Cartier? Is it a fashion watch or a luxury watch brand? This goes back and forth, guys. If you asked me this question 15 years ago, I would have said Cartier is a fashion watch, and it's primarily a quartz watch for women. After 2004, all of that started to change, and here's why. Cartier is a true luxury watch purveyor today and a highly integrated manufacturer to rival the best like Patek and Audemars Piguet. They can do everything in-house from their sprawling integrated complex at Le Chaux de Fonds. They make their dials, they make their bracelets and clasps, they make their cases, they make their movements, and they do the engineering in-house too. So all of that being said, Ignore the high horology pieces from Cartier. They're great, and if you can buy them for 20 cents on the dollar, well bought. That's what you should probably pay for them. The best Cartier watches are the ones you can buy for under $10,000, and in that price range, they have few equals for innovation or quality. Here are my picks. The 2018 Cartier Santos Large. Guys, this was the story of SIHH 2018 for Cartier, and I'm a believer. I was a skeptic going in. I was a believer after trying the Santos Large, which isn't quite as large as it sounds. It's nicely sized. 9.9 millimeters thick like an AP 15400 Royal Oak Auto. It's 39.8 across the wrist, so 9 to 3. And then it's 47.5 lug to lug. So if you can wear a JLC tribute to 1931, you can wear this thing comfortably. It also has a slightly cambered case like a Richard Mille to curve around your wrist. Quick switch and smart link. You need to know these both. Quick switch is the system from the Cartier Roadster. It's the system IWC uses on the AquaTimer. If you have fingernails, you can swap the strap and bracelet back and forth on your Cartier Santos. That's why I'm showing both of them right there. You can bring them both on vacation. For the surf and the turf, this watch has got you covered. But SmartLink is where Cartier really sets itself apart. This one is all theirs. You can use that same fingernail to remove and replace links in the bracelet. I tried a prototype at SIHH and it blew my mind. I never imagined something that works so well to allow you to dismantle your bracelet without tools would simultaneously have no negative consequence on the manufacturing tolerances or the solidity of the bracelet. Eyes closed, you would never imagine that bracelet comes apart with anything but a screwdriver. This thing is a home run, and I can see it finding its way to every Richemont brand if Cartier is not careful to guard its territory. 100 meters water resistant, automatic with a date. The only sports watch feature this one lacks is Loom. More on that in moment. It's uh, that this or that pole. So we have a pole tonight. Um, we always we always kind of want to have fun with this, but so I wrote the show basically on a topic that I think is pretty important and maybe we don't touch on enough. And uh, that happened to be Peter's pick for this topic. And one of, uh, one of the things I want to touch on is the glory days, right? So when brands that maybe aren't doing so well now, back in the day when, when they really pushed boundaries, when it was really all about the watches and making something that was different and, and really pushing the envelope. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, you can see on the this or that graphic we have up on the screen right now. And for the people on the podcast that can't see, uh, I have picked a uh, Frank Mueller. Surprising pick for me, right? Uh, not a not a huge Frank Mueller fan, but I like this watch a lot. And uh, Peter has picked the aforementioned Breitling. So I'm going to get right into the this. I'll go first. Um, if we go ahead and pull up that graphic, uh, large full screen if we can. And then we will go, look at that guy. Beautiful dial. You'll notice chronograph. This particular version has a, something a little bit, a uh, little sexy, a little hidden on the back of the case. So I'm glad to have the watch here in person. Um, we're going to go ahead and pull in on a live shot of this. So what you'll notice is you got a, you got a really nice chronograph there, right? On the front, beautiful dial. Frank Mueller always has beautiful dials. Those turned in corners gives it that very night, to, night and day vintage feel. Um, pretty nice track dial. And then what you might notice if you look a little harder is that crown is a little proud of the pushers. You can see the crown comes up off the pushers. That means there's something special on the back. So this is a, first and foremost, it's a chronograph and it's actually a mono pusher chronograph, even though it looks like a normal layout, it's a mono pusher. 
and then you guys probably guess what's coming, but this is the Las Vegas. So you have a roulette wheel in case you ever need to take your watch off, gamble with some friends. There you go. And then uh, look at it go. So a very cool complication. That's all spring driven. That's all real watchmaking. It's all random. And you can just do that for days. Super fun. So a very cool piece. And for me, this really harkens back to like when I first started getting into the watch game and looking at Frank Mueller as a true master of complications back before they used to just put that on the back of every case. Um, so that's why I picked this piece. I thought it really kind of spoke to the subject at hand. And I had another watch pick that I was going to do before this, which I think better elaborated my point. But uh, that watch, I was describing it to a customer and he bought it. So I couldn't bring it on the show. All right. So uh, good for him. He, he got a cool watch. This one is from Sven T, and he says, Tim, you've mentioned that you prefer the Rolex Yachtmaster 2 to the Daytona. On what basis do you justify that? The pricing, the size, and the functions aren't even close. Well, first of all, you can prefer one watch to any other watch, but in terms of one as a replacement for the other in the steel Rolex chronograph class, I think it's more of a fight than you imagine, and here's why. First, pricing is deceptive. Yes, at $12,400 for the steel cosmograph, you're talking about six grand less than the Yachtmaster 2, but it quickly doubles in price pre-owned, whereas the steel Yachtmaster 2 immediately becomes a fifteen to $16,000 pre-owned watch, so advantage Yachtmaster 2. Second, concerning fit and size, it's closer than you imagine. This is a huge watch, but it doesn't wear that way. For whatever reason, in the flesh, in the metal, on this skinny wrist, I find that the Yachtmaster fits just as well, and if anything, I have more of a sense of solidity, durability, and impressive heft when the watch is on the wrist. Make no mistake, this does not wear like a deep sea. Despite a nominally similar case size, that ain't a deep sea. That wears more like the Daytona in real world. Okay, uniqueness. I see 10 steel ceramic Daytonas for every one of the Yachtmaster 2. This watch is no longer uncommon. Marked up, yes. Wait listed new, depending on whether you're buying pre-owned and dear or new with a long wait list. The bottom line is they remain available, and if you're willing to pay the ransom, you can have that watch tomorrow. I see 10 of these real inventory for every steel Yachtmaster 2. Okay, now let's talk about the movement in the Yachtmaster 2, because I am a movement nerd. The 10-minute programmable flyback or fly-forward chronograph is just more interesting to me. When this came out in 2007, it was the most complicated Rolex ever made, and it still runs the Sky Dweller dead even in terms of complexity. I also find that the 10-minute programmable countdown feature has more real-world utility than the Daytona. Why? Because this is one big arrow index pointing at giant numerals, and I just find it a lot easier to read. These are good eyes, dudes, but let me tell you, reading subdials on a Daytona, it can be hit or miss. Sometimes you have to estimate what you're reading on the minute register. This is crystal clear, and while I'm wearing the EZM 1.1, which has a 60-minute chronograph, 60 minutes only, I can even pare it down to 10 and tell you, with a 10-minute countdown, I can handle nine out of every 10 tasks that I usually assign to a chronograph. Plus, the fly back and fly forward is so cool. How many fly forward chronographs do you find? Plus, no screw down pushers, always ready to use, and the same water resistance, 100 meters. Whichever watch you prefer, there is no wrong answer, but in terms of my comparison between Yachtmaster and Daytona, they're more comparable than you think, and give me the Yachtmaster every time. Um, so Peter kind of touched on the how cool this watch is. We'll, we'll let him show it again. And then uh, just as a reminder, we have the poll. So you guys, please feel free to vote. Um, actually, we encourage you to. And then uh, look at that. Actually, uh, Pete, for, for what that is, I mean, that watch is pretty clean. I, yeah, when we pulled it out of the vault. I was surprised. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece, uh, you know, 41 millimeter which, um, you know, happens to be my size. 40, 41 is a good size for me. And, uh, I, you know, the reason why I picked it is because of exactly what you said. It's clean. Uh, I believe it was only made in about a stretch of five years. Um, as you can see, the, it's turning now, the wheel. Um, I mean, the, the date, um, not date wheel. Um, the countdown. The, yeah, the countdown is, is now going to one. Um, and it'll, it'll go all the way to, I believe, 
um, all the way minutes. back up to 10. Yep. So, so the, yeah. And then one of the cool things with playing with this watch is it actually has half, it measures in 30 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. So it yep. has like, it has halves. you'll notice when it comes back around, I don't know if we're going to wait till it gets there, but it'll say like half between the one and the two, which is pretty neat. Um, so if, uh, for the guys that aren't watching that might just be listening while they're driving, um, it's, it's basically like a jump hour there it goes. with a yeah. window. Um, so normally you would see a jump hour display the hour, whereas this is digitally in an analog format displaying the minute for the chronograph as opposed to, uh, as opposed to having like a hand show the minute. So it's kind of a cool complication, not something you see a lot. Um, it's pretty rare actually, and that's what makes this piece special for me. It's also a Montbrilliant uh, Navitimer class family in a 41 millimeter case, which we all know the, you know, the smaller size Navitimers are highly desirable. Um, and, and if I'm not mistaken, this guy's like five grand, right. $5,500. Very, very affordable for I mean, what it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and for the money, I think it's a very cool complication, great story. Um, and I, I think that's a, that's a hell of a pick. By the way, if you want to spend Royal Oak offshore money on your Cartier, this is one of the few cases where I can say spend more than 10 grand on your Cartier. The skeleton, which is hand skeletonized and hand finished and available in full steel can be had for just over $26,000. Obviously, it's not going to have the resale of Audemars Piguet, but it's also going to have a degree of reliability and serviceability that you don't get with Audemars Piguet, and a toughness inherent in this setup that I would not ascribe to Royal Oak Offshore. A beautiful piece, and by the way, this is not electro spark erosion. This is real hand skeletonized movement manufacture. Okay, drive to Cartier. This one flies under the radar, partly because it's so thin. The drive to Cartier, extra flat in steel, 39 millimeters in diameter by 6.6 .6 millimeters wide. Think about that. The Royal Oak Jumbo, which we call the extra thin, is 8.2, 8.1 millimeters thick. This is 6.6 .6 with a Piaget High Horology MC430 manual wind movement. So you've got a high horology movement in a high horology ultra thin case. In 2017, this became what the drive should have been from the beginning, but it was only available in rose gold and white gold that year. For 2018, you can buy it in steel. And for $5,600, I cannot think of a better luxury watch to buy in the dress watch class than this thing. For $5,600, this has no competition. Think of this as a $5,600 case study in high horology done right. There is no equivalent to this watch. I love it. The Calibre de Cartier Diver Blue. This one came out in 2016. 7,900 US bucks on the strap and worth every penny with a steel case. We saw the Calibre de Cartier in 2010. It was awkward, weirdly proportioned, and not my cup of tea. You guys evidently agreed because Cartier went back to the drawing board and for 2014 we got the Diver. For 2016 we got this watch. Now. It's a hidden gem among dive watches, not just for Cartier, but for the entire industry. It's also the first ceramic bezel on a Cartier diver. The black bezel model has ADLC. This one is ceramic. Superb bezel refinement. It feels like a Blancpain 50 Fathoms or a Grand Seiko dive bezel. And it is wonderfully slim, well under 12 millimeters. It makes a Submariner feel chunky. It makes a Sub feel like a sea dweller. I'll also say this, built for small wrists. You will not find a better 42 millimeter case to wear on a small wrist. This one has side to side arc and camber and it's objectively very compact at just under 48 millimeters lug to lug. I'm blown away by this thing. It's a real ISO. So 6425 dive watch. So it's not just a diver in name, it is a diver in fact, and the loom aspect is sensational. Check out my review of this one if you want to see more, but this would probably be the Cartier that I would buy with my own money.